Here I will be dwelling on a more advanced part of discussion in SN reactions, and I'm referring to molecularity of SN reactions. Make sure that before you proceed, you have already watched my first discussion, introductory discussion on SN reactions. And just as a review, let's look at the details. First, when we're dealing with SN reactions, we're primarily dealing with what we call substituted alkanes, which involve classes like alcohols, alkyl halides, ethers, thiols, and amines. What's common in all of them is that I have a functional group that is electronegative, like OH, halogen, SH, electronegative atoms, right? Directly attached by a single bond to an sp3 carbon. And now, moving back to the original slide, the general format tells us that in SN, the nucleophile is going to attack our hydrocarbon portion, or R, and then later on, the L is expected to go out, given the fact that L actually stands for leaving group. And the products are these, the leaving group left, and the nucleophile is now the new thing attached to our initial R group. For purpose of this discussion, we will refer to the R group, the hydrocarbon group, as the substrate. Now, molecularity, specifically, is a detail that is related to chemical kinetics. And in chemical kinetics, we have what we call the RDS, or the rate determining step. For a reaction which has multiple steps, the rate determining step is the step which dictates how fast or slow the overall reaction is. Let's say I have a reaction that has four steps. The rate determining step there, let's say, is one of the four. And if the rate determining step is slow, then all of those four reactions are slow in collection. But if the rate determining step is fast, then all of those four steps combined is still fast. So that's the meaning of the RDS. Now, specifically, in SN reactions, we have two types, SN1 and SN2. For SN1, the meaning of the number one there is unimolecular, meaning that out of our two reactants, the RL and the NU, only one of them participated in the rate determining step, our RL. But in SN2, 2 here stands for bimolecular. Not only did we involve the substituted alkane RL, but also the NU. Thus, two of them participated by molecular. We need to see more of this, like we need to see the step-by-step -step process, of course. And so, we can refer in this portion to clarify those steps. For SN1, we have the first step here, wherein the leaving group gets the electrons from the bond between R and the leaving group. So the leaving group, well, leaves and leaves R without an electron, giving rise to a carbocation. Take note that this step is actually the rate determining step in SN1. Next, the second step involves the nucleophile finally going to our R part such that the final product is the hydrocarbon part or the substrate finally attached to the nucleophile. So if you're asked how many steps are there in SN1, of course, it's clear that we see here two steps. And if you're asked which is the rate determining step, that is the first step, the leaving of the leaving group. For SN2, of course, it's different. There is only one step, actually. And that means that, I mean, you don't have any other choice. This is also automatically the rate determining step, which involves, remember, both the RL and the NU. So you see them here now. And in SN2, in one entire step, just one single step, that's what, that was redundant, the nucleophile will come to the substrate and the leaving group will simultaneously go out. Therefore, we are finished after that. Very quick, just one step. Now, after this, it's one thing to know the steps of SN1 and SN2, but another thing to know why these things happen in the first place. Now, to understand better how SN1 and SN2 operate, imagine that you have R as the, let's say, focus of the discussion, and let's imagine that R is being competed for by our leaving group and the nucleophile. 
this should make sense because R or carbons are supposed to be the partial positive things here. And if there's something common with the leaving group in the nucleophile, they are both supposed to be partially negative or electron hungry. And basically, you can think of SN1 and SN2 as two possible scenarios depending on which of the nucleophile in the leaving group is stronger. For example, in SN1. Maybe we can use human-like analogies here. Let's say that R is currently partners with L. And let's say that nucleophile is someone who wants to displace L from the equation. Why do you think the nucleophile was not able to participate in the first step for SN1? Maybe it's because even if the nucleophile tried to get in here, the leaving group is stronger than it. Therefore, there's no sense in trying to win this battle. Something like that. Such that, you notice when the nucleophile started to go into the equation? Look at our R. The nucleophile only had the chance to get in the moment that there is no leaving group anymore. Because again, the nucleophile in SN1 is su supposedly weaker than the leaving group. It's like saying the nucleophile just waited for the chance or the opportunity to go in the moment the leaving group actually left. So we can say that in terms of comparing the nucleophile in the leaving group, for SN1, the leaving group was stronger, given the behavior of the nucleophile here. Or in SN2, how was it possible that the nucleophile just, you know, suddenly barged in, went to the substrate, and was so bad as it kicked off the leaving group? Maybe it's because the nucleophile here is much stronger than the leaving group. Strong enough for it to force the leaving group to go away. So maybe in SN2, we can imagine the nucleophile is far more powerful than the leaving group. That's why everything happened in a single step. Thus, we can say that for SN1, our nucleophiles are the weak ones. For SN2, our nucleophiles are the strong ones. That is the first differentiating factor of SN1 and SN2. Of course, you need to know examples of them, so let's look here at the bottom. Weak nucleophiles for SN1 include reagents like HX, HCl, or HBr, alcohols, and carboxylic acids. Strong nucleophiles, which are more likely to be seen for SN2 type reactions, involve reagents with metals like sodium alkoxide, sodium cyanide. Doesn't really have to be sodium. Sometimes you can see like potassium. Um, ethanoate, and so on and so forth. Okay. I'm oh, sorry, this is not potassium ethanoate. This is potassium ethoxide. Also, we have PBR3 and SOCl2, which are things you have seen before. Okay. So we can pretty much say that once I see HX here, I'm already getting a clue that this particular reaction that I discussed in a previous video is an SN1 type reaction. And the moment I see PBR3 or thionyl chloride here, most likely these are SN2 reactions. And notice how I actually mentioned before that I'm really referring to a specific type of alcohol for the specific reagents here. What I'm trying to say here is that not only is the nucleophile a factor in determining whether the molecularity is uni or bimolecular, we can also actually look into the type of substituted alkane and then that will help us further in determining the overall molecularity. So let's go to that. I'm trying to say here that, for example, if I have an alcohol, a tertiary alcohol would have a much different behavior in terms of SN versus a primary alcohol. Or maybe a methyl halide is going to react differently as compared to a secondary halide. So how specifically can we go? First, let us recall that if I start from the right, that is from the methyl part, going all the way to the left, that is to the tertiary part, the stability of the carbons increase. Specifically, the electron donating groups from carbons start to pile up and that will increase the stability of the carbon. Remember that there was an SN wherein we saw a carbocation. If I'm gonna ask you, which SN was that? SN1 or 2? Going back, we see our carbocation in SN1, right? So what am I trying to say here is, if I have a carbocation, I need my carbocation to be stable. 
And the most stable, therefore, is the one that will give me the most possibility of performing S and 1. So thus, I could say that, for example, since a tertiary carbon is the most stable of all, then tertiary carbons or tertiary alcohols or tertiary alkyl halides and so on are the most probable to perform S and 1 reactions. Whereas a primary alcohol, for example, is not going to be much preferred in terms of S and 1. Okay, so writing that here, again, the preference is tertiary followed by secondary followed by primary followed by methyl. In fact, um, most likely, tertiary is the only type of alcohol or alkyl halide or so on that is sure to perform SN1. Secondary is actually somewhere in the middle. It can sometimes be perform SN2, sometimes SN1. Uh, when you go to the primary and the methyl carbons, they're very unlikely to perform SN1. That is based on experimental data. Now, going on the opposite direction, if I start from left to right, there is also some pattern that we can see here. Remember, if I have a tertiary carbocation or a tertiary carbon in general, the fact that there are a lot of carbons around it, there's a lot of steric effect, right? It's bulky. There's a lot of things going on. So we can say there's not a lot of space in the tertiary carbon. As compared to, let's say, a methyl carbon, the fact that methyl has only hydrogens around it, these are just small atoms. And you can just imagine that they don't take up a lot of space. Therefore, as I go from left to right, my free space increases. Or my steric effect decreases. It's just saying the same thing. And you know what? Later, I will discuss something called a backside reaction. Just remember for now that whenever you hear the word backside attack, it is something that is performed exclusively by bimolecular reactions, or SN2. I need a lot of space to perform what we call the backside reaction, and therefore, if I'm talking about free space, then this is the best. So, the SN2 preference actually increases from left to right. Methyl is the most likely to perform SN2 given that it has a lot of space, and, and tertiary is the least likely to perform SN2 because there's so much carbons here. It's so cramped up there. So for SN2, the preference goes in the direction of methyl is the most likely, followed by primary, followed by secondary, followed by tertiary. And if I said a while ago that tertiary carbons are going to perform almost only SN1, then therefore, I can say that tertiary carbons are unlikely to perform SN2. SN2 can be possible in secondary, but I did mention that it's, it, it depends. So you can pretty much imagine that in terms of our alpha carbons for the substrate, the secondary carbon is the middle part. Sometimes SN2, sometimes SN1. Now if you ask me, how will I know if, if that's the case, if it's SN1 or 2? There is something that we can look at later. Now, that means that the methyl carbons and primary carbons are the most susceptible or the most preferred in terms of SN2 reactions. So let us pause for a while, and before we proceed to the bottom portion, let's make a short recap. Remember that we have first identified two molecularities of SN, SN1 and SN2, demonstrated how they look like and how many steps are there, what the rate determining steps look like, and now we are actually discussing the factors to determine if a reaction is SN1 or SN2. The first major factor that we looked at a while ago was the type of nucleophile. If the nucleophile is weak, then most likely we're going to have an SN1, and for strong nucleophiles, it's SN2. So it's imperative for you to be very familiar with examples of weak and strong nucleophiles, because that's a major clue in most cases. Now, other than the nucleophile, you can look at the alpha carbon of your substrate. And again, let me repeat this. If I have a tertiary alpha carbon, most likely it's going to perform SN1. If it's primary or methyl, most likely it's going to be SN2. But if I have a secondary alpha carbon, it's, it's somewhere in the middle and it may depend on other factors. So, to make sure that we can apply this when uh, a test question arises, let's have some practice questions. So, I have three reactions, and our task here is to determine if it's SN1 or SN2. 
Remember so far, our tool set allows us to look at two factors in order to determine the molecularity. The nucleophile, if it's weak or strong, and the alpha carbon. So let's look at number one. Let's try to look at the nucleophile, and maybe it can automatically give us the answer. SOCl2, if you remember a few moments ago, is listed as a strong nucleophile. And if it's strong, that only means that this is SN2. But for example, let's say that in an unfortunate circumstance, you forgot that. How can you answer this? Oh, I don't know what SOCl2 is. I don't know if it's weak or strong. Well, you can try to look at the alpha carbon of your substrate. This is the functional group, and therefore this one is the alpha carbon. What type of alpha carbon is this? Or what type of carbon is this in general? I see only one carbon attached to it, so it's primary. And where does primary most likely fall? Yeah, that's right, SN2. So that actually confirms that the answer here is really SN2. Okay. For number two, let's look at the reagent. So HCl, and that's an HX. If you remember, that is listed as a weak nucleophile, and weak nucleophiles give us the answer SN1. But if you want to make sure, you can refer to the alpha carbon here. So this is the alpha carbon, right? And what type of carbon is it? One, two, three. Yep, that's tertiary. And where does tertiary lie here? SN1. So that really double checks that the answer here is SN1. So as you can see, it's quite a reliable thing also to look at the alpha carbon and then conclude what type of molecularity exists. But, for example, in number three, if you try to look at the alpha carbon, I'm going to ask you, what type of carbon is this? Two carbons only, so it's secondary. And remember I told you a while ago that the secondary carbon is somewhere in the middle. It can be SN2, it can be SN1, depending on other factors. That means that if I see a secondary alpha carbon, that is not conclusive. So you need to look at other factors. Luckily, the reagent here clearly states that I have a metal, sodium, and it's now clear that this is a strong nucleophile. Being a strong nucleophile, then this should be SN2. Later, we will try to discuss even greater details in SN1 versus SN2, including solvent effects and even the effects on the stereochemistry of the reactant versus the product.